last time I saw you, I think it was last Thursday, and um, what I'm doing is gradually working my way through a series of uh, practices and values derived from Buddhist culture, which are often known as a set of teaching, basic and um, Uh, quite mundane sort of uh, skills or um, values in life towards more esoteric ones. And the idea is that if you are able to practice any one of those, you can jump in on the staircase at any point, and it will you, lead you gradually to the next step on the path. And we have come to number 11 today. And what I generally manage to do is to talk about a half of a um, half of the subject in a particular talk. So I'll start today and I'll continue next time. Uh, I see you. But um, this uh, today's talk is a start of a subject which I guess you could call family values, from a, a Buddhist-led perspective at least. Um, particularly from the point of view of something known as filial piety. Ring any bells? Not particularly? Well, we'll find out more. But up until now I've been talking mostly about basically standing on one's own two feet financially, being able to support oneself, not being a burden on others in society, that sort of thing. And there were four things in that particular set of blessings to do with setting oneself up properly in life or becoming a pillar of society. Sorry, setting oneself up properly in life or making oneself useful. And in between that and becoming something more of a pillar of society comes this set of blessings to do with family values. The idea being that before you can do something to help society in general, you have to make peace with your own family first of all. And your family may be more or less extensive, but at the very least, generally, you have your... Everyone has some parents in their life. Yes. And the others may be more optional, but generally, parents are a part of everyone's life in one way or another. So the first of these is cherishing our parents. Uh, the next one after that will be to, more to do with raising children uh, so they don't grow up into little monsters, um, to do with our husband or wife, and to do with not letting, leaving one's work undone. Yeah. So, the basis of this idea of filial piety or respect for one's parents coming from the Buddhist perspective is that um, although gratitude comes a lot later in the staircase uh, uh, and is dealt with specifically, right down at number 25 in the blessings of life, here at this blessing number 11 we start to meet up with gratitude specifically in the context of our parents. And this specific context is said to be valuable because generally um, it's something which uh, f the sort of um, kindness that we have received at our parents' hands is particularly obvious for most people. Something which one can pick up on very easily when one is looking for positive values in life. It's something fairly obvious for people to pick up on. And the Buddha said that uh, it's very rare to find two sorts of people in the world. Firstly, a sort of person who's willing to initiate a favor. And secondly, a sort of person who is grateful when someone does them a favor enough to repay that debt of gratitude back to them. And from the point of view of parents, uh, when they have done quite a lot for us, and I'll go into more detail a little bit later on, um, then if we can, it, they are certainly someone who has initiated a lot of kindness towards us in their lives. And if we are able to somehow notice that, reciprocate that, then it will make us a stronger 
uh, a deeper and more spiritual person as a result of that. So far so good? Haven't quite lost you yet? This whole facet of, acid, of uh, gratitude um, is recognized in many cultures. Um, Cicero said that it's, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but it's the parent of other virtues too. So if you've got gratitude, then other things can build upon that. This is the idea of this staircase, yes. Um, some have called it the single most important ingredient of living a successful and fulfilled life. Can you think why? Jack Canfield. Oh, the chicken soup for the soul guy. Hmm? Her chicken soup for the soul. Uh, well, apparently, it, like if you can appreciate goodness around you, then you can pick up on that goodness. But if you are blind to it, then you you got um, uh, um, some uh, a lot of uh, hard work ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, and if you have gratitude towards your own parents, at the very least, then your children will pick up on that and treat you accordingly. Yeah, so it will be passed along. And even from the point of view of meditation, it's said that the sort of richness of heart from appreciating the goodness in others, especially that which is very obvious from those who are close to us, um, crystallizes something positive in our own hearts and minds, which is definitely very useful when it comes to meditation. Some people have struggled with meditation for many years and they feel their meditation has somehow got stagnant or rather dry. But if you top it up with the sort of qualities from appreciating and having gratitude for the goodness, which one can see, especially from, let's say, one's parents, then it will help to restore that sense of flow and richness in our practice as well. So this is why I'm talking about it in the... Uh, context of me meditation today. Yeah? Not everyone agrees with gratitude or uh, being thankful towards their parents. Um, there are certain movements um, in a society or philosophy which goes against the grain of gratitude towards parents. Uh, some which I've noticed come particularly from an evolutionary stance, um, that of, for example, the idea that parents are only really taking care of their children because they want to see their genes passed on. What do you reckon? There's this idea of the selfish gene where people are basically just uh, a way of replicating the genes in their cells. So we're just being used by our genes to um, perpetuate themselves. Therefore, any kindness that comes from parents is just like an ulterior motive. Do you reckon? Not convinced. Okay. Uh, there's another one uh, to do with hereditary sin, where people say that all the bad stuff in our lives got passed down from our parents and therefore you have to make a clean break and never see them again. Yeah, usually uh, dodgy cults like this sort of uh, rationale. Mm. Never, never speak to your parents again. Cut off all the badness from your life. Not convinced? Okay. Um, and of course there are some patrilineal cultures apparently where you have to prove yourself to be the macho person by uh, being cruel to your parents. Not convinced. Okay. Well, you'll probably uh, come to the right place then. Because within the Buddhist culture, anyway, um, even going back to something called the Asokan Edicts, have you heard of Asoka before? Emperor Asoka? 
come on, those of you familiar faces must have heard of Ahsoka. Uh, emperor going back about uh, 1,500 years in India. He used to be like a really sort of um, tough king um, going to war uh, all over the place and being generally quite a cruel sort of guy. But then he picked up on teachings of Buddhism and meditation and became a completely different person. And uh, he tried to, he left behind a lot of teachings uh, which he engraved on rocks. So this is why 1,500 years later there's still the sort of uh, evidence remaining to be dug up by archaeologists and stuff uh, from, from, from that sort of era. And these things are called edicts, uh, some of the sort of sayings which he tried to preserve in stone. Mm. And one of them says, if a man should be, live to be 100 years old, carrying around his mother and father on his shoulders, uh, so he carries them around on his shoulders for the rest of his life, even then he will not have rendered enough thanks to those parents for all the ways in which uh, they have shown him kindness. I'll rephrase that again. The kindness one has received from one's parents is so great that even if you were to carry them around physically on one's shoulders, one mother on one side, father on the other side, for the rest of one's life, one would still not have repaid all the goodness which they have done for you. So, Parents are seen, uh, in, held in great esteem in Buddhist culture for the kindness that they have shown to their children. Some people think that it's pretty easy to be a parent. What do you reckon? Some people said it, it's the easiest falling off a log or something. Well, um, there's a quite an interesting sketch on YouTube. I think it was part of Mother's Day initiative. Uh, and uh, they, they set up a fake job interview, something like this. Yeah. Um, because most people who go for a job interview, they expect that any effort they put into their job uh, will be, in terms of time and energy and ability, will be rewarded and recognized and remunerated. Yeah? So they, they posted um, a fake job a title called a personal assistant uh, and started randomly interviewing people uh, to see who would want to get this job. So we don't know what the job is yet. And the interviewer explained that the job has a great range of responsibilities, uh, some of which are quite extensive. And the first requirement for the job would be uh, mobility, because at a high level of stamina, uh, they will, this might be required for 40 hours a week, or maybe longer than that, or maybe hundreds of hours a week, or perhaps unlimited hours per week. Sound pretty tough already. Tough job description. Sometimes uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, with no breaks available. And generally, uh, if you're an employee, you have a legal right to 20-minute rest breaks if you've been working for more than six hours. Know your rights. Uh, so you might want to phone up your union rep at this point. <laughs> uh, so you might be allowed to get your lunch, but only after the associate has done eating their lunch. And ideally, someone who is qualified for this job uh, might have a degree in medicine, in finance, in culinary arts, and must be able to do a detailed risk assessment of uh, anything that might threaten the life or the health of the associate which they are looking after. Uh, and in all the situations, uh, you have legal responsibility for anything that might occur to threaten uh, your charge at any time of the day. And the associate will need constant attention. Uh, sometimes you have to stay up with them all night. Uh, you might need to help with their laundry, uh, homework. Uh, you have to 
make sure that they are clean at all times and go to bed on time and that they brush their teeth and they you must be able to work in a chaotic environment uh, especially on vacations like uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year and so on also uh, you need to have a cheerful disposition at all times um, yeah, you might think this is a twisted joke this job there's no company car um, you have to provide that yourself and it probably will be a minivan um, so you need to have a valid driving license you might be doing a lot of driving uh, supermarkets uh, football games uh, sport meets um, possibly to the emergency room and the trickiest part is probably going to be the teenage years where you are going to be required to deal with hormonal rampages and teenage heartbreak, uh, puberty and also the talk and and then we come now to the salary for this job. Are you interested in the job yet? So the position is going to actually pay you absolutely nothing. It's pro bono. Yeah. And you might be, you'll be doing the job completely free. Uh, in fact, you might need to take a second job to finance doing this job. Because it doesn't actually pay you real money. Yeah. Uh, first year, the sole pay will be happy baby giggles and irresistible cuteness. Uh, later on in your job, you might get some inside perks like pride, and if you're lucky, the occasional thank you. And generally, you won't be rewarded in any substantial way um, until the associate becomes a parent themselves and learns to appreciate you. And uh, yes, and I hope you won't be accuse me of being sexist, um, the job requires a nine-month paid internship, unpaid internship. <laughs> so you, have you guessed what this inhumane job is yet? Yeah, you have guessed. Uh, parenthood and mostly motherhood. And ironically, if, despite these terrible inhumane conditions, uh, currently people holding this position or one similar to it, it adds up to about 43.5 million people worldwide who manage to meet every requirement. So this perhaps uh, will bring home to you some of the sacrifices uh, made by your personal assistant, the one that helped you out. <laughs> um, and uh, help you to appreciate it a little bit more. Generally, the parenting remit is summarized um, within Buddhist culture in terms of five stages of parenting. Um, given that for the human species, more than any other species, um, providing food and shelter and clothing and education, medical care for offspring goes on for many years after they are uh, notionally able to take care of themselves. Uh, parents often have to put themselves at risk or in debt in order to look after children. If you find parents breaking the law, poaching, shoplifting, 99 times out of 100, they are doing it to put food on the table for their family. If it was for themselves personally, they'd never take such a risk. And not only that, but there's also a spiritual side to parenting as well, where it's not just enough to put food on the table, uh, but you have to be a good example of the behavior that you would like to see in your children as well, because if your children catch you saying, do what I say, not what I do, then uh, you have major problems uh, on the horizon. In characteristically Buddhist style, um, Buddhists tend to look back even before birth to the debt of gratitude that parents, uh, children owe their parents. Um, so it can be said that, okay, that refers to the nine-month unpaid internship, but even before that as well. Um, but yes, the sacrifices... 40 weeks of going for med regular medical checkups, uh, eating a nutritious diet, avoiding all the things that you'd like to have but can't have, 
and avoid any extremes of emotion for that 40-week period are all huge sacrifices made uh, even before birth. And thankfulness uh, to parents goes back even before, can you believe it, conception? Before conception? So the idea is that even if a child is born and immediately put up for adoption, they still owe their parents. And I've got a little story to finish off with to maybe explain a little bit more about um, appreciating what one's parents has, have done for one, even if they didn't go through the whole um, upbringing part of your life. So even if you never saw them after you were born, you still owe them. And here, this is the um, reason why um, uh, we, it's said to be something very useful for us to, to inspire gratitude, to be able to appreciate the way we've been supported by parents. But here comes the story anyway. And the story is entitled, An Orphan with a Debt to Pay. It's a traditional story. So, once upon a time, there was a certain woman of the streets. And by profession, she knew that if she became pregnant, if the child turned out to be a boy, then she would be unable to keep him. So, as uh, her pregnancy progressed, she became more and more anxious, day by day until at the end of nine months her fears were realized and the newborn babe was a boy. So many times she took the boy to the edge of the river with the full intention to throw him in, be done with it, finish the whole business, but with tears in her eyes from having carried her in her womb for so long, uh, she could not bring herself to do the deed. So, at the same time, she could not keep the baby. Otherwise, it would destroy her livelihood. For as a good. So, she compromised by, in this country, probably would leave it in their church, lobby somewhere. Hmm? They still do that? Probably not. She left him a bundle by the roadside, where she thought, there would be a compassionate passerby who would surely rescue the child and adopt him. And it turns out that the first passerby that morning, this is probably somewhere in Asia, was the abbot from the local temple going around with his arms bow um, to collect food in the morning. And what should he see at the side of the road but a, a baby wrapped up uh, and still very much alive? And he was afraid for the baby's welfare, so he took the baby back to the temple. And the abbot guessed how that baby had come to be there. But in the absence of anyone coming forward to claim the baby, he continued to provide all the food and shelter and clothing and education that the child needed to grow up to teenage. And eventually the little boy could run and play with the other children and do all the other things expected of him but he had a chip on his shoulder. And he would run and hide if any of the other children who he played with teased him for not knowing who his parents were. So the boy would, at that point, blame his unseen parents for the predicament in which he found himself. So one day the abbot heard him complaining out loud about his parents who had abandoned him. And the abbot thought, the time has come to have a little talk uh, with this boy about his life. So the abbot started a conversation with the boy by asking him, if someone were to give you a dollar, would you curse him? And the boy said, of course not. I would bow to that person, or at the very least, thank them, and I would never forget my gratitude to them. So the abbot continued, and if someone were to come along and offer you a dollar for your life, would you take it? And the boy said, of course they wouldn't. Do you think that's all my life is worth? So the abbot continued, ten dollars then. You must be joking. And the abbot raised the sum to a hundred, thousand, ten thousand, 
hundred thousand, and still the boy would not part with his life so easily right up to a million dollars. And asked why, then the boy replied that even a million dollars is useless to you if you have no life in which to spend it. Logic, so far so good. So, the abbot continued, what if someone were to come along and offer you a dollar to cut off your right arm? Would you take it? Of course I wouldn't, said the boy indignantly. Do you think that's all the integrity of my body is worth? Ten dollars then. And he raised the sum again, a hundred dollars, thousand dollars, ten thousand, hundred thousand, a million. And the boy would not part with a million dollars for his right arm. So, don't you want to become a millionaire? asked the abbot. And the boy said, even a million dollars is no substitute for a lack of one's physical integrity. So, the abbot continued his little lesson. And if someone to come along and offer you a dollar to cut off your little finger, would you take it? Of course they wouldn't, said the boy angrily. Do you think I can put a price on a part of my human body? Ten dollars then. And the boy said, forget it. So the abbot raised the sum to a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, million. And the boy would not part with his little finger for that price. Why? Because a million dollars could not replace a healthy human body. So the abbot concluded, Just now you said that if someone gave you even one single dollar, you would thank them, bow to them, never forget your gratitude to them. And yet, your parents have given you a healthy human body for free, even the little finger of which you would not part with for a million dollars. So how come you sit here cursing them for not having given you more? So this story illustrates uh, how even if we have nothing to thank our parents for, but from birth onwards, uh, even if we have nothing to thank our parents for from birth onwards, we still owe them a debt of gratitude because uh, due to them we have a million dollar body uh, that allows us to do all the good things that we do in our lives. Uh, that we want to in this world. So this is uh, my little introduction to the subject of why we need to value the goodness that we have received from our parents, even if we find it hard to appreciate or hard to visualize or hard to maybe separate out um, the, the good and maybe bad things that we have noticed in our parents, uh, we still owe them a great de deal. But how exactly to repay that debt of gratitude, then that's something I will talk about uh, in my next, the remainder of this uh, talk, which I will give next Thursday, not this Thursday, next Thursday. But for today I'll finish off with a few little publicity announcements. Firstly, for those of you who have just come fresh to meditation today, um, I would say if you found the practice useful and I would encourage you to practice further because practice makes perfect and the meditation that you do each time accumulates a sort of energy and a mastery which will bring greater and greater benefits into your life. Um, the way to do that uh, would be to try to find maybe 20 minutes a day to meditate at home. Um, might be in the morning, might be in the evening, at a time of day which is fairly uh, uninterrupted for you, at a time of day when you don't feel too tired out, and try to sit down, meditate, relax your body, relax your mind, focus at your center, use the mantra if you need to. And if you can do that every day, then it gets easier step by step. You find that in that 20 minutes, you'll be able to go further each time. Generally, after even with the best intentions in the world, uh, the inclination to meditate will um, get less as time goes on if you are left on your own. So uh, there are certain things which you can do to sort of boost your inclination to meditate, one of which might be to listen to meditation guidance while you're meditating. There's an app called Mind Gem which you can download for free onto your mobile phone, and Android or iOS. And there's a lot of audio tracks on there from, from various 
meditation teachers in our tradition, which you can follow along with, and also time your meditation as well as you are meditating. So you might want to look into that. Apart from that, meditating as a group is often quite encouraging, and every Tuesday and Thursday evening we have meditation classes here. Um, generally, the Thursday evening class has a little bit of a longer meditation, up to 45 minutes, and Tuesday is a little bit shorter one. But apart from that, it's the same format, more or less. If you like to meditate from the comfort of your home more, they have also meditation via Zoom, still a hangover from the uh, pandemic, um, between 7 and 8 each Saturday. Uh, you can tune in to that and get meditation teaching online, and you can even ask questions for the, from the monk leading the meditation um, as well. And the Zoom password for that is the same as for this event, um, which is the full moon, which we organize once a month. Um, next one is coming up on Saturday, the 16th of April, but all those Zoom details there are ones that you can also use on the Saturday uh, evening meditations as well. For those looking for something more extensive, uh, especially amongst the young men, um, the latest news on the European trying out being a monk for a month uh, project uh, is that the venue has been moved to Denmark instead of Belgium this time round, which made me quite uh, interested in it as well. I've been to Denmark for a long time. Um, but yes, you can try out being a monk for a couple of weeks or a month. Uh, and the sign-up is at eopdmc.eu. Yes, I think it's free of charge as well. And the next weekend retreat coming up here is between the 8th and the 10th of July. Um, generally, it's an overnight one uh, where people sleep over and meditate Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday finishing up on the afternoon. That might be something you'd like to look into as well if you want to take your meditation further.